Welcome back to another video. Today we got two part video. All right. That was a weird way to say that. Anyways, I just wanted to show you guys a little bit of the futures, what's going on in the markets, and then what I'm doing about it and a feature presentation called WTF happened in 1971. Because there's a lot of MMTers out there that think that printing money has no consequences. Nothing bad happens from printing money. Everything's all hunky dory and we just move on and you know, you just have to take money out of the system through taxation or whatever, blah, blah, blah. But once you see the preponderance of evidence that printing money has been a bad thing for the standard of living of Americans, you, you might change your mind, okay? So of course the standard of living goes up as far as technology over time, new things are invented, all right, obviously. But the amount that you're able to buy with your labor, your time, the only true currency has gone down, okay? A lot of people don't understand the money game because they don't understand what it actually represents. Your money represents your time. It's a representation of your time. So if I have to work for four hours for something that I used to be able to work for one hour for, I don't care what the dollar figure says. All I know is four more times of my time is gone, okay? That's what really matters. So anyways, let's look at the NASDAQ. We've got S&P 500 futures are down. We've got Dow 30 futures are down and the NASDAQ is down the most. So for those of you guys out there who don't know, um, this is my growth pie, all right? So this is these are my highest conviction growth stocks, okay? Tesla, Beyond Meat, Netflix, Altria, which actually is, I believe, the eighth best performing stock of all time. Costco, Facebook, you can read the rest. So I usually put into this growth pie when I see that the NASDAQ is taking a big beating. So I put in about 150 today into the growth pie, and that is that. Some of you guys are asking for a portfolio reveal. Maybe I'll do all of my portfolios sometime later, but let's get into this what the f happened in 1971 not trying to get demonetized today so let's check it out and what just to preface this really quick what happened in 1971 i'm going to tell you we broke from the gold standard so when we broke from the gold standard there were a lot of consequences so check it out productivity went up 246 percent we always have this arrow here and these in this article at 1971 compensation 115 percent all right and that's from 1948 so compensation went flat productivity went up so what does that mean that means that the wealth of the nation went up somebody got rich right and the compensation didn't go up so somebody got rich and somebody stayed exactly the same so that's what we're seeing let's move on Real GDP, wages, trade policies in the U.S. So check this out. Once again, 1971, right there. Everything's kind of in lockstep before that. Real GDP per capita goes up, which makes sense, right? We see a lot of cheap money going into the, the economy, so somebody's getting rich, okay? But the median real wages and earnings of full-time workers is staying flat, all right? Move on to the next one. Once again, we see all of these growth factors in lockstep before we break from the gold standard. 1971, 95th percentile of income earners goes up, and these lower income earners stays relatively flat. Okay. Once again, top 1% of earners, their incomes were relatively flat after the World War period. Okay. 1971 hits and it skyrockets. Whereas the other people, 90, bottom 90% of earners, their income was climbing. Okay, 1971 hits, we break from the gold standard, we start printing a bunch of money, and it fl goes flat. And this isn't a new thing either. This isn't a new thing, as we'll see later in the video. This is something that happened when we tried to print our way out of the Great Depression as well. We see income inequality. So, we've got A relentless 50-year decline in wages as a share of the total income of the economy. All right. So essentially what that's saying is that the total income of the economy, less and less of it is going to wage earners. 
it's just going straight to the top. All right. Another good graph here, we've got top 1% uh, concentration of income has risen sharply since 1971. So it was going down after the World War period and it goes back up. Okay, income share of the top 1% relative to the bottom 90%. So the top bottom 90% was taking income share, 1971 hits and it goes back up. Okay, percentage of black income as a percentage of, average black income as a percentage of white income. So we see fast progress from the 1948 era all the way over to 1971. 1971 hits and we kind of flatten out. So not to say that the Civil War or the uh, Civil Rights period was a bad thing. Obviously it was not, but that we, we still flattened out after we left the gold standard. So there's something else to it than just racial justice, right? There's something else to this economics thing than just racial justice, okay? Because there was no racial justice over here, but we're seeing the gains. There's some, it, we've got to understand that there's a difference between the economy and racial justice, all right? Economics and racial justice, it's very, very different things, all right? And one leads to the other. A good economy, or good economic standing, rather, leads to less oppression, so, all right. Real GDP and mean media, uh, male income. So we see right here, 1971, we flatten out male income. So those were typically, back in those days, were the, the main income earners. So we see gains in female income. I'd say that's a good thing, that gains in female income as a percentage of GDP. But that also tells another darker tale. That means that more women are working, right? which is not necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, but it is an indicator that you have more two-parent households working. Whereas, who knows, you know, maybe they didn't want to work, all right? But now they have to work, all right? So it kind of tells, it tells a good story, uh, you know, of, of empowerment there that women start to work and their wages start to increase as a percentage of GDP. But it also can tell a darker tale where you're saying, okay, well now some of these women may not have wanted to work, but now they have to work because the single income is not cutting it anymore. All right. Don't cancel me for what I just said, please. All right. 1913. That is when the Federal Reserve Bank went into effect. As we see here, we see in, um, income inequality start to spike. Then it starts to go back down after we stop printing ourselves out of the Great Depression and the wars. Then 1971 hits and it goes right back up. Okay, and what do we see in the real economy right now? We see a bunch of billionaires being made. It's, it's the same story. So this one shows a share of the net U.S. wealth. So top 0.1%, all right? We see that the bottom 90% started to grow in wealth. And then right here, 1971, we see their wealth go up a little bit more and it starts to decline where the 0.1% starts to have more and more wealth. So back here, we see that there's huge wealth inequality and we see a lot of populism. Over here, we see huge wealth inequality and we see a lot of populism. So that's what we're seeing again. It's the same story, guys. And this is where the Federal Reserve was created, right over here. All right, so 1971 cost of living. This one's actually really good. All right, so new house, $25,000. Average income, $10,622. So basically, if you look at all these things, Harvard tuition, movie ticket, all of these things, you could get a lot of things back then with your average income. You could send your child to college. You could send them to Harvard, which is a very prestigious school. Okay, you could buy a pound of bacon for 80 cents, right? The things that you could buy with your income is more important, like I said earlier, than the actual number of the income. That's what really matters. When you have a booming economy, that means that you're making a lot of goods and services and you're making a lot of things that are cheap to buy. That's what that means. All right, so next, moving on to the next thing. So consumer price inflation. So from 1910 all the way over to 1971, we have about 300% price inflation. Whereas after we break the gold standard, we go all the way up here to 2300% cumulative price inflation in 2015. All right, once again, CPI goes from about, let's say, 4 in 1971, more than a 5x over here into 2009. 
electricity, food, and fruit prices, right? So let's just focus on food here. So let's just call this about 40. We go over to here. This is more than a 5X, right, in food prices over that time period. And it's only getting worse. Gas prices are getting worse. Food prices are getting worse. And I'd imagine every other thing that people actually buy, your electricity, your rent, your mortgage payment, those are the things that people actually pay for. And the, the inflation is huge. Okay, another little statistic that shows some wealth inequality. Median house price in Boston and New York has skyrocketed, whereas the incomes have not, okay? And that's because when you print a bunch of money, it typically ends up with the asset holders. It ends up with the people who own homes, right? When you print money for, pe when you print money for people to go pay their rent, they go pay it to people who own assets. When you print money for people to go spend money at businesses, they give the money straight to the businesses, all right? So you see more wealth inequality when you see more printing. How many hours would you actually have to work, right, to actually buy a house? That's essentially what this graph is showing. So you have to work more and more hours just to afford a house. Same thing here, mortgage payment as a percentage, or, um, as a percentage of household income in Australia. After 1971, we see it skyrocket. Here, gold reserves going down, we see gold prices going up. This one's interesting because a lot of people will tell you, well, there haven't been very many currency collapses, but look at all of these countries that have had currency collapses in the past hundred years. It's like we can't think back to a hundred years and think that, you know, maybe this could happen again. And this is only in the past 40 years. Look at all these currency collapses after 1971. So prices doubling, the yellow ones, mean that prices were doubling in weeks. The orangish ones mean prices were doubling in days. And the red ones means prices were doubling within the same day, in hours. Okay, so this is the occurrence of currency crashes after 1971. We see very few until 1971, and then they just spike up. There's a huge amount of currency crashes. Same thing, Napoleonic Wars, we see these way back here, there's a bunch of currency crashes, and not until 1971 do we see even more currency crashes. These are some popular currencies such as the mark, which died here, and other European currencies, Japanese yen, pound sterling, and the dollar against gold. So they've been crashing relative to gold. Banking crises, all right? Right here, we see more banking crises after 1971 than we saw after the Federal Reserve banking uh, system was put into place and after we, after the great, during the Great Depression, rather. So we see more banking crises than during the Great Depression as a result of breaking from the gold standard. All right, federal debt as a percentage of GDP. We see that these debt finance wars, the Great Depression and uh, the Second World War, we got a lot of debt, right? But we started paying it down we broke the gold standard and now it's skyrocketing once again. All right, public debt, debt held by the public. So essentially we were paying our debts down, we were paying our debts down, 1971 hits and it starts going right back up. US national debt, 1900 to 2020. So we see that it's under 1 trillion for a long time, long as the eye can see. Can't even see the debt over here. After 1971, we break from the gold standard, we give the government the power to print money, and look at it, it skyrockets, okay? It's not even on this chart anymore, it's over at 28 trillion, so it's up here somewhere in 2021. Once again, we see debt going up, gold going down, we see deficits versus surplus. After 1971, we see pretty much all deficit besides this short time period. Balance of trade, I believe that's what this is. No, this is surplus or deficit. So we see all deficit, all deficit after the gold standard is broken. Okay, this one is federal receipts. So essentially, this is the government spending. Government spending goes up after uh, we, we were at three trillion at 2018, but now I believe we're at eight trillion. So that's going up exponentially. Schiller PE ratio. So after 1971, we see a little bit of a crash and then we see a bunch of bubbles over here. That's the housing bubble, that's the dot-com bubble. And right now we're up, I believe in the 30s for Schiller PE in 2021. Okay, 
hours worked to buy the S&P 500. So essentially this is saying, how many hours do I have to work to have any wealth? That's the question that this graph is answering. So the average is 30.9. We're getting close to 120 over here. So essentially you have to work four times as hard to have any wealth today. That's basically what this graph is telling you. Speculation versus production. We see an upwards trend, an upwards trend in industrial production. But as cheap money came into the system, we see a massive influx of speculation. So we're getting those bubbles like we saw earlier. Personal savings rate, we see that trending down after 1971. People can't save any money. I wonder why. Probably because they don't have any money because they're paying these exorbitant prices for the goods. Okay. Net savings as a percentage of gross national income. Once again, not saving any money. Balance of trade is going down after 1971. We can see that we're in a trade deficit. Once again, balance of trade. Oil in nominal terms. So how much a barrel of oil costed? It was very flat over here. And then as you see, 1971, it went way up, crashed down after the coronavirus lockdowns, but now it's going back up interest rates so all the way from 3000 bc all the way to 1971 interest rates stayed steady between about 10 percent and about two percent then we pegged them down here pegged them to zero for the great depression and they rebounded and spiked way back up then we pegged them again for 2008 and we're pegging them again right now and they're starting to spike back up. So that's what people are worried about. People are worried about if interest rates come over here, prices are going to absolutely collapse. So people are trying to get out. All right, 10 year bond yields. They've gone, they went up, spiked up, went down and down and down. All right, Henry Adams curve, I'm not gonna get into that as much. I'm not super interested in that, but it is a little bit interesting if you want to check that out yourself ideological positions of major parties. So basically this is just showing that uh, the left is going further left, the right is going further right. This one's actually really funny right here. This is grade levels. So on the left here, we've got grade levels of the speeches. So we see here, basically they were giving more complex speeches. The speech level was about nine and a half, ninth grade, 10th grade level, 1971. After that, we go towards populism and we're basically just appealing to people's feelings. So we see Republican down here at eight and a half grade and we see ninth grade for Democrats. So we're basically talking to people as if they're middle schoolers and we don't, we're not giving anybody any facts. We're just kind of appealing to people's feelings when we're giving political speeches. So let's see, 1971, the interesting one here is that a lot of these foreign affairs, social control, civil rights, those have gone down the drain. Everybody's worried about the economy because everybody is poor. Everybody's poorer, I should say. Okay, number of pages in the Federal Register. So a lot of people want to solve these problems that we're having with regulation, but after 1971, after the break of the gold standard, we're seeing an ever increasing amount of regulation. These are basically laws and proposed laws. That's what is in the Federal Register. So. As we've had more laws, more regulation, we've had more poverty, more poverty. So, all right, clotcher. So this is basically something that you can do to break the filibuster, something that you can do to cram forward uh, any agenda that you have or whatever you want to push, push through the Senate. So clotcher voting has increased exponentially after 1971. All right, rating things essential or very important. So the number of people that are rating being well off financially has gone through the roof since 1971. And it kind of goes back to the hierarchy of needs, right? So this one you could ca categorize as self-actualization, developing a meaning meaningful philosophy of life. That could be self like self-actualization. Whereas becoming an authority of my field, that could be like, you know, a sense of self-importance. Helping others who are in difficulty right? That one still stayed pretty high. So basically this is telling you that people feel more poor and it's because they are. All right. Inflation adjusted amount per pupil uh, of spend per pupil. So we see scores down here, math scores, reading scores, science scores, they're either flat or down. 
ever since 1971, whereas the spending in the staff per student has gone through the roof. Okay, number of lawyers per population has been going up. It's gone up about 4x, or more than 4x. It's gone up since 1971. It's gone up, yeah, about 4x. Incarceration rates, 1971, you see them go up for females and up for males, hugely, exponentially even, which makes sense. As you make the population more poor, you see more criminality. People living with their parents, Back here, this is during the Great Depression. You see 43%, you see 42%. Right now, July 2020, you see 52%, 47%. So you haven't seen these levels of people living with their parents since the Great Depression. So, and they wanna tell us that we're in an economic boom. All right, median age of first marriage, 1980 to, 1990, 1890 to present. Okay, so we see that the age is going up, which makes sense. I mean, if you can't have a one parent household, it makes sense that if they're both working, they're both gonna be busy, they're both gonna be tired, they don't want kids, they don't have time for a relationship, so the age is going up for men and women. All right, divorce prevalence. Once again, makes, makes perfect sense. Divorce prevalence makes sense to go up once you have two people that are both working on their own, they're both basically doing their own thing. Divorce prevalence makes sense to go up, all right? so. That's what we see from 1971. Percentage of children born to unwed women. So as we see here, before 1960, pretty much black, everybody was under about 20%. Now, after 1971, 72%. 52% for Hispanic, 40% for all, 28.6% for white. And it, it really makes sense. I mean, if you think about all the government programs, you don't really need to depend on that marriage, right? You have a lot, of, a lot more women that are working on their own, and I'm not trying to be misogynistic here. I'm just saying that's the structure. The family structure has changed to where two people are working. So you have people that are acting more independently. They're just saying, hey, I'm going to live over here. You live over there, and you know, we'll meet up and hook up, whatever. It just makes sense, right? The culture has shifted. Obesity since 1971. I don't know if it's the PE programs or what it is, but obesity has been skyrocketing. All right, it was 5% back here in 1971. Now it's closer to, what's that, 15%, all right? 1971, we got national health expenditures down here pretty low, pretty flat if you go backwards, but it is exponentially growing as you go forward. Growth of physicians and administrators. So physicians, obviously that's gotta go up over time as the population goes up, but look at the growth of administrators by percentage and then the growth in healthcare costs. So we've got an administrative bloat. So anyways, hopefully you guys like this video. I know this one's a little bit more of a, a boring video, but there's a lot of information in here. And if somebody has the inkling that MMT hasn't had any consequences, please send them this link. I'm gonna link this down in the description of the video because there have been a lot of consequences as a result of MMT. And you don't have to be on the negative receiving end of any consequences of anything that the government does. Because if you know these things, you know how to avoid them. But anyways, yeah. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So people think that there are quote unquote solutions to a lot of these problems but the reality is when you change one thing you create winners and losers all right so the best thing that you can do for yourself and for your community is be in the know help other people be in the know so that you can avoid these negative outcomes and prosper so hopefully you guys liked the video if you did make sure you give it a thumbs up and i'll see you guys in the next video